Robert George Domingos and Linda Faye Edwards are driving on Highway 101 in a 1956 Pontiac. After parking their car alongside Highway 101, they take a 10-minute walk using a descending trail to the beach. Sometime later, they are approached by a person, unknown to this day, who presumably attempted to contain the couple by using pre-cut lengths of rope. The defenseless couple seemingly made an attempt to run for their lives, when they are halted by a series of shots from the perpetrator. The unknown man then approached the victims and fired more shots at close range. Their bodies are then moved nearly 30 feet to a nearby shack, where the perpetrator presumably tried to torch the shack by lighting up the tarpaulin covering the door. The unknown man then left the crime scene, leaving no eyewitnesses behind. The bodies are discovered by Highway Patrolman Paul Schultz inside the shack close to the beach. Linda Edwards was struck eight times, while Robert Domingos was shot 11 times. There was no sign of the perpetrator and no eyewitnesses of the event, but only some parallels to the later incidents, which of course were unknown at the time but would later pile up, all pointed to one specific person, the infamous Zodiac Killer. Even with the evidence carelessly left all over the crime scene, it led to more questions than answers. Within the shack, police found several unspent ammunition boxes along with some spent ammunition, several pre-cut lengths of rope, and spent matches. There were no price tags on the ammunition boxes, but from the lot number, it was ascertained that they were sold at a nearby Air Force base, suggesting a military background. It was believed that the pre-cut cords were used by the perpetrator in an attempt to contain the couple, and the matches were possibly used to torch the shack. What's unusual is the perpetrator carrying needless several boxes of unspent ammunition and then simply abandoning them inside the shack. The scorch marks on the tarpaulin covering the door do indicate the killer tried to light up the shack, but those marks could have been there before the event and could be unrelated to the crime. If the assailant wanted to set the shack on fire to destroy the evidence but failed to do so, Abandoning all the ammunition boxes and pre-cut rope inside the shack was certainly not a clever decision. Moreover, it is difficult to ascertain that the perpetrator would go through the strenuous task of moving the bodies nearly 30 feet uphill to the shack over difficult terrain instead of leaving the crime scene immediately. This could suggest that the man was in sound physical condition or there was more than one person involved. There is no solid evidence to suggest that the perpetrator behind this attack was the Zodiac Killer, but certain resemblances make it hard to dismiss it as a coincidence. The perpetrator attacked a lone defenseless couple on a beach. He attempted to contain the victims by using pre-cut rope. He presumably had a military background, and he was possibly in sound physical condition. Despite the absence of evidence, this recurring pattern would increasingly raise doubts about his innocence in connection to this incident. Of all the atrocities committed or vaguely associated with the Zodiac Killer, the murder of Sherry Jo Bates is perhaps the most mysterious of all. While the involvement of the Zodiac Killer in this attack remains a puzzling enigma, ascertaining the actual timeline of her death is a mystery within a mystery. On October 31st, 1966, Cleophis Martin, a groundskeeper at Riverside Community College, was traveling along Teresina Drive at around 6.30 in the morning. Soon he came across the lifeless body of a woman lying in the driveway. Stunned by the unexpected image, he called the police. The victim had been stabbed multiple times and was identified as 18-year-old Sherry Josephine Bates. Sherry apparently left her home the previous evening at around 4.45 p.m. to borrow some books from the library but never made it home. Nearly 10 feet from her body, a wristwatch was discovered which likely belonged to the killer. The strap of the watch was broken, and there was swirling in the driveway floor, indicating signs of struggle. Her car was found non-functional about 75 yards from the library. The perpetrator had apparently disabled her car by tampering with the wire of the distributor. There were no eyewitnesses of the event, but the books borrowed by Sherry Jo Bates were found inside the car, meaning she was likely attacked after leaving the library premises. What's interesting was the location of the crime scene, which apparently indicated that she was lured back to the library after finding her car non-functional. But this theory is contradicted by the eyewitnesses. 
A student eyewitness stated that he saw Sherry Jo Bates shortly after the opening time of the library around 6 p.m. Another set of eyewitnesses were four men dressed in work clothes sitting on a fence across Sherry Jo Bates' car, who said they saw Sherry Jo Bates near her car at around 6 p.m. One more eyewitness was a college librarian who stated he thought he saw Sherry Jo Bates that evening. Except for these eyewitnesses, no one ever saw Sherry Jo Bates inside the library, including her close friends who were there from 6.30 up to the library closing time of 9 p.m. This puts Sherry Jo Bates entering the library after 6 and off the premises before 6.30 p.m. What's unusual about these eyewitnesses is that four men sitting on a fence just across Sherry's car were there from 6 p.m. to at least 7.15 p.m., but never saw anyone tampering with Sherry Jo Bates' car. Even being just 75 yards from the crime scene, they did not hear or see anything suspicious at all. No screams, no cries for help, no one being abducted or attacked, nothing whatsoever. Even if the perpetrator somehow managed to abduct Sherry Jo Bates and attacked her on the driveway, it is inconceivable that more than 60 people coming in and out of the library that evening failed to notice Sherry Jo Bates lying on the dirt driveway. A few residents of a nearby apartment heard screams in the campus area sometime between 10.15 and 10.45 p.m., followed by the sound of a car starting up some two minutes later. If the screams were to be taken as those of Sherry Jo Bates, and the sound of the car as the perpetrator's car leaving the vicinity of the crime scene, the timescale of this event is contradicted by the autopsy report, which places the estimate time of her death between 6.30 and 8.30 p.m. One month after the incident of Sherry Jo Bates, Riverside Press Enterprise and Riverside Police received a typed letter known as the Confession Letter, claiming responsibility for the crime. The letter started as, quote, She was young and beautiful, but now she is battered and dead. She is not the first, and she will not be the last. I lay awake nights thinking about my next victim. Maybe she will be the beautiful blonde that babysits near the little store and walks down the dark alley each evening about seven. In the middle of the letter, the author described the details on how he carried out the crime, saying, quote, I first pulled the middle wire from the distributor. Then I waited for her in the library and followed her out after about two minutes. The battery must have been dead by then. I then offered to help. She was then very willing to talk with me. I told her that my car was down the street and that I would give her a lift home. When we were away from the library walking, I said it was about time. She asked me about time for what. I said it was about time for her to die. The author then carried on explaining further details about the crime and asked to publish this letter for everyone to read it. Was the author of this letter the actual killer of Sherry Jo Bates? Well, the observations made from the injuries on the body are somewhat consistent with details on the letter about how he did it. But it is difficult to ascertain that the author of this letter was exactly the same person responsible for the slaying of Sherry Jo Bates. Exactly six months after the murder, Riverside Press Enterprise, Riverside Police, and Sherry Jo Bates' father received another letter. Handwritten this time, the letter to the police and press enterprise stated, quote, Bates had to die, there will be more. And the letter to Sherry's father stated, quote, She had to die, there will be more. The forensics retrieved a fingerprint from the letters, but to this day, no matches were ever found. With no further leads, the case eventually became cold without any closure. But the situation was about to get a lot worse for the police and Bay Area residents who were completely clueless of the events that were about to unfold. Soon, such confession letters to media outlets and to the police, after a murder, would become a matter of routine and spread fear among the locals of the San Francisco Bay Area. Police would start following the children's school buses because of threats from the perpetrator. People would start deciphering codes provided by the killer himself to reveal his identity and seemingly sit in front of television to hear his actual voice. Five days before Christmas, on the night of December 20th, 1968, Stella Borges was heading east towards Benicia on Lake Herman Road at around 11.20 p.m. While crossing a turnout, headlights of her car picked up a boy lying on the ground near a car. Just a few feet from the car, she saw a girl lying on the side of the road. Upon sensing trouble, she immediately rushed off east towards Benicia to look for the police. 
Eight minutes later, Officer Pinta arrived at the crime scene. The couple had apparently been shot at the turnout just a few minutes earlier. The victims were identified as David Arthur Faraday and Betty Lou Jensen. Arthur was shot once in the head, while Betty was shot five times in the back. Neither survived that night. According to the forensics, the killer apparently fired three warning shots to force the couple out of the car. One of the bullets shattered the rear right window, and another one penetrated into the car's headliner. Once they were out of the car, he shot David Faraday, causing Betty Lou Jensen to run for her life, before she was halted by six shots from the perpetrator, five of them hitting her in the back. Once again, the crime was seemingly motiveless, or possibly a grudge against couples. There were no eyewitnesses to give the suspect's description, but there were a few nearby travelers who may have seen the suspect's car. Some 15 minutes before the murders, Peggy and Homer Yor were traveling on Lake Herman Road, headed west to a nearby construction site at around 11 o'clock p.m. According to the testimony of Peggy Yor, as they were passing the turnout, she saw a male and a female in the front seat of the car. After addressing their usual commute, they were back at Linkerman Road approximately two minutes later, this time heading east. Upon passing the turnout for the second time, they noticed the couple's car still at the turnout, with nothing out of the ordinary. James Owen, another eyewitness, who was traveling on Linkerman Road at around 11.14 p.m. heading east, stated that he saw two cars at the turnout. One of them was a station wagon, which was the victim's car, and another car nearly 10 feet to the right of the victim's car. James could not give the description of the second car, but this testimony would later change three days later, in which he added he heard a gunshot when he was about a quarter of a mile beyond the turnout. Six minutes after James Owen passed the turnout, Stella Borges would find the victim shot, laying on the ground. This was the first confirmed attack by the Zodiac Killer, of which he himself will claim responsibility and provide evidence after another attack just about four miles northwest of the Lake Herman Road murder site. Up to this point, there were no eyewitnesses to give any kind of description of the perpetrator. On July 4, 1969, nearly six and a half months after the attack on Lake Herman Road, the Zodiac Killer would strike again. Darlene Farron and Michael Macho were at Blue Rock Springs parking lot at around midnight. Soon they are joined by an unknown man who pulled around his vehicle on the left side of their car. The driver turned off the lights and stayed inside the vehicle. After a minute, the man turned his car around and went away. But five minutes later, he returned to the parking lot and this time pulled over behind their car nearly 10 feet away. The driver exited his vehicle and approached them while holding a high-powered flashlight and a handgun. Michael and Darlene thought him to be a police officer and started searching for their identification. The man suddenly raised his handgun and fired a series of shots, hitting both of them inside the car. To avoid the shots, Michael took refuge in the back seat of the car. After firing five shots, the man pulled away from the car, but upon hearing screams of Michael Majo, the man came back and fired two more shots at each of them by leaning into the vehicle. The assailant then went back to his car and drove away. Michael opened the car door and fell onto the ground. Three teenagers who were traveling along Columbus Parkway entered the parking lot nearly 10 minutes after the incident and discovered Michael severely wounded, lying on the ground. Michael Majo survived the attack, while Darlene wasn't so fortunate. Michael gave police the very first description of the assailant as a white male around 26 to 30 years old, possibly 5'8", short light brown curly hair, heavy set beefy build, possibly 195 to 200 pounds or even larger, and wearing a blue short-sleeved shirt. According to Michael, the assailant had a notably large face. Nearly 40 minutes after the attack on Darlene Farron and Michael Majo, the Vallejo Police Department received a phone call. The man on the phone said, I want to report a double murder. If you will go one mile east on Columbus Parkway to the public park, you will find the kids in a brown car. They were shot with a 9mm Luger. I also killed those kids last year. Goodbye. This call was never recorded, as the dispatcher did not have the equipment to record incoming calls, but the call was traced back to the payphone at a gas station on Spring Road and Tuolumne Street, close to Darlene's home. 27 days after the attack on Michael Majo and Darlene Farron, Vallejo Times-Herald, San Francisco Examiner, and San Francisco Chronicle received a letter. 
Dear Editor, This is the murderer of the two teenagers last Christmas at Lake Herman, plus the girl on the 4th of July near the golf course in Vallejo. To prove I killed them, I shall state some facts which only I, plus the police, know. The author then mentions some details about the crimes he committed on Lake Herman Road turnout and Blue Rock Springs parking lot, like the number of shots fired, the type of ammunition used, and description of the victims. One interesting thing that the author attached with the letters was a cipher, about which he said inside the letters, In this cipher is my identity. If you do not print this cipher by the afternoon of Friday, the 1st of August, 1969, I will go on a kill rampage Friday night. I will cruise around all weekend killing lone people in the night, then move on to kill again, until I end up with over a dozen people on the weekend. The letter ended with a symbol containing a circle with a crosshair or a plus sign. This was the first confirmed letter from the Zodiac Killer. In two news articles on August of 2nd and 3rd, Vallejo Police Chief Jack Stiltz, unconvinced that the letters were from the actual killer, asked the author of these letters to provide more details. Very next day on August 4th, the San Francisco Examiner received another letter. Dear Editor, this is the Zodiac speaking. In answer to your asking for more details about the good times I have had in Vallejo, I shall be very happy to supply even more material. By the way, are the police having a good time with the code? If not, tell them to cheer up. When they do crack it, they will have me. On the 4th of July, I did not open the car door. The window was rolled down already. The boy was originally sitting in the front seat when I began firing. When I fired the first shot at his head, he leaped backwards at the same time, thus spoiling my aim. He ended up on the back seat, then the floor and back, thrashing out very violently with his legs. That's how I shot him in the knee. I did not leave the scene of the killing with squealing tires plus racing engine, as described in the Vallejo paper. I drove away quite slowly so as not to draw attention to my car. The author then continued to explain further details about the crime. But one thing unique about this letter was apparently a pseudonym that the author had given to himself as the Zodiac, hence marking the beginning of the name the Zodiac Killer. Six days after the cipher was published in the newspapers, two school teachers, Donald Harden and Betty Harden, deciphered the code. The decoded message came out to be, I like killing people because it is so much fun. It is more fun than killing wild game in the forest, because man is the most dangerous animal of all. To kill something gives me the most thrilling experience. The best part of it is that when I die, I will be reborn in paradise, and all that I have killed will become my slaves. I will not give you my name because you will try to slow down or stop my collecting of slaves for my afterlife. While law enforcement was following dead-end leads, the Zodiac Killer would strike again, this time during daylight hours of September 27th. Brian Hartnell and Cecilia Ann Shepard were enjoying the afternoon by the shoreline of Lake Berryessa. A few minutes into their outdoor engagement, Cecilia saw a man coming down the hill and staring at them about 200 to 300 yards away. She informed Brian about the suspicious man, but since the man was far away, there was no cause for immediate concern. But the man would come closer and closer, and shortly he was just about 75 to 100 feet away from the couple. Cecilia, noticing something off, again told Brian about the strange man. At this point, the man hid himself behind a tree before putting on a mask. He then appeared in front of the couple. The man was wearing a black executioner's hood with a waistline bib. He had a knife, some white plastic clothesline, and a gun pointed at the couple. He claimed to be an escaped convict and recently killed a prison guard. He asked Brian Hartnell for his car keys and some money, which he tossed over to him. The man then approached and contained the couple by using a plastic clothesline and stabbed them multiple times. Once the assailant left the crime scene, the couple managed to lose their bindings. Brian Hartnell fought his way back up to the nearby road to seek help, where he was rescued by the park ranger. Before the arrival of the ambulance, Sergeant David Collins arrived at the crime scene and took the statement from Cecilia Ann Shepard. Cecilia recalled to the police that she saw the assailant before he put on the hood and described him as a white male with brown hair. She said to Sergeant Collins that the attacker was maybe an inch taller than him. Sergeant Collins was approximately 5'10". Brian Hartnell described the assailant as 5'8 to 5'10", 225 to 250 pounds, with dark brown hair and told the police that the attacker had an accent and wore a black hooded mask up to his waist, and there was a white circle with a symmetrical cross on the mask on his chest area. 
Sergeant Collins discovered a footprint different from the shoes of the victims, leading from Knoxville Road to the crime scene and back again. These footprints were believed to be of Wingwalker shoes, suggesting military background. He also saw car tracks leading away from the vicinity of the Carmen Ghia, Brian Hartnell's car. When he looked at the victim's car, he saw a message left by the killer, written with black marker on the passenger door. The message contained the dates of the attack on Lake Herman Road and Blue Rock Springs parking lot, along with the time and date of the attack on the current day at Lake Berryessa. At around 7.40 p.m., nearly an hour and 10 minutes after the attack, Napa Police Department received a phone call. I want to report a murder. No, a double murder. They are two miles north of Park Headquarters. They were in a white Volkswagen Carmen Ghia. I am the one that did it. The call was traced back to a phone booth about 27 miles away from the crime scene in downtown Napa, and a palm print from the phone booth was recovered, but no matches were ever found. Brian Hartnell survived the attack, but two days after the incident, Cecilia died from her injuries. This attack at Lake Berryessa had suspicious parallels with the attack on Robert George Domingos and Linda Faye Edwards on June 4, 1963 at Santa Barbara. Both incidents took place near Shoreline, in both cases, the victims were a couple, and the perpetrator attempted to contain the couple with confinements. The footprints were identical on both occasions with wingwalker boots, indicative of military background. Apart from the perpetrator's description, police had no other substantial leads to narrow down the search. No sketch, no murder weapon, and no tangible connections with the victims. All the crimes seemed to be motiveless, and the police appeared to be frustrated, while the Zodiac Killer was becoming more and more lethal as the time duration between the incidents was decreasing significantly, with the next incident happening just two weeks later. An incident in which the Zodiac Killer narrowly escaped the authorities by taking full advantage of a slight miscommunication among police, and the chance was lost forever. On the night of October 11, 1969, Paul Lee Stein, a cab driver who picked up a fare from the vicinity of Union Square, had no idea whatsoever that the man he just picked up was the Zodiac Killer. Upon reaching his destination around 12 minutes later, Washington and Cherry Street, the Zodiac Killer took out his gun and shot the cab driver on the right side of his head. The killer then exited the vehicle and wiped off several parts of the cab before removing a part of Paul Stein's shirt with the help of a knife. Three teenagers nearly 60 feet across the street eyewitnessed these events from their residence and called the police at around 9.58 p.m. They gave the description of the suspect to the police dispatcher as a white male around 5'8 in his early 40s with a heavy build, reddish blonde hair, and wearing eyeglasses, a dark jacket, and dark brown trousers. According to eyewitnesses, after killing Paul Stein, the Zodiac Killer walked north onto Cherry Street and then east onto Jackson Street, where he would find himself on the brink of the authorities. Meanwhile, two nearby police officers, Donald Falk and Eric Zelms, who were patrolling Presidio Avenue, responded to the radio call. But within this radio call, the dispatcher mistakenly relayed an inaccurate portrayal and described the suspect as a black male. When they turned west onto Jackson Street and came across a white man wearing navy blue jacket and brown or rust-colored trousers walking near the intersection, there were no red flags of suspicion. They continued west on Jackson Street and then south onto Washington Street before reaching the crime scene. Here they came across Armand Pellicetti, the first respondent to the crime scene, who eventually gave them the correct description from the eyewitnesses. Upon realizing they just missed the suspect, they drove back to Jackson and Maple Intersection to look for the suspect. But it was too late. Despite extensive search of the area, the killer was nowhere to be found. Police recovered numerous fingerprints from different parts of the car, and with the help of eyewitnesses, the first sketch of the Zodiac Killer was made, which did not imply the accurate age, so an amended sketch was drawn and released to the public. Two days after the attack on Presidio Heights, San Francisco Chronicle received a letter along with a piece of Paul Stein's shirt. This is the Zodiac speaking. I am the murderer of the taxi driver over by Washington Street plus Maple Street last night. To prove this, here is a blood-stained piece of his shirt. I am the same man who did in the people in the North Bay area. He then continued the letter by mocking the police for their actions by saying, The San Francisco police could have caught me last night if they had searched the park properly, instead of holding road races with their motorcycles seeing who could make the most noise. 
At the end of the letter, he wrote something that not only induced more fear among the public, but took the Zodiac Killer to a whole new level. He wrote, School children make nice targets. I think I shall wipe out a school bus some morning. Just shoot out the front tire, then pick off the kitties as they come bouncing out. On November 8, 1969, San Francisco Chronicle received another letter, this time attached with a cipher. The writing of the letter was, This is the Zodiac speaking. I thought you would need a good laugh before you hear the bad news. You won't get the news for a while yet. P.S. Could you print this new cipher in your front page? I get awfully lonely when I am ignored. So lonely, I could do my thing. At the end of the letter, he claimed the responsibility of killing seven people in total by writing the names of the months in which he did it. By August, he was claiming the slaying of two teenagers, Deborah Furlong and Kathy Snoozy, on August 3rd, 1969. The assailant behind this incident was ultimately caught, and is known to be Carl Francis Werner. On the other hand, the cipher attached to the letter was a 340-character cryptogram containing different symbols and special characters. It would take more than 51 years to decode this cipher. The decoded message was, I hope you are having lots of fun in trying to catch me. That wasn't me on the TV show, which brings up a point about me. I am not afraid of the gas chamber, because it will send me to paradise all the sooner, because I now have enough slaves to work for me where everyone else has nothing when they reach paradise, so they are afraid of death. I am not afraid, because I know that my new life is death. Life will be an easy one in paradise. One day after the letter with the cipher, San Francisco Chronicle received another letter, this time a lengthy seven-page letter saying that from now on he would change his pattern. In the letter he said, I shall no longer announce to anyone when I commit my murders. They shall look like routine robberies, killings of anger, plus a few fake accidents. He also claimed that on the night of Paul Stein's murder, he was stopped by two policemen, but they never suspected him. Two cops pulled a goof about three minutes after I left the cab. I was walking down the hill to the park when this cop car pulled up. One of them called me over, asked if I saw anyone acting suspicious or strange in the last five to ten minutes. I said yes, there was this man who was running by waving a gun, and the cops peeled rubber and went around the corner as I directed them. I disappeared into the park a block and a half away, never to be seen again. In the next pages, he wrote about how he had made a death machine and soon he would use it on a bus. Fortunately, no such thing ever happened. Such letters continued for years, at least until late 1987 when Vallejo Times Herald received a letter on October 28th, bearing a lot of resemblances with the first confirmed Zodiac letter on July 31st, 1969. The conclusive nature of the Zodiac Killer's last letter is still a matter of debate. The cab driver, Paul Lee Stein, is believed to be the last confirmed Zodiac victim among six others. However, many people are skeptical of this argument and believe Zodiac to be responsible for more victims because of the future unsolved crimes in the area before and after the canonical victims. The authorities were nowhere near the Zodiac Killer. He appeared to be far too clever, or fortunate, to leave the authorities outsmarted and baffled with each incident. The common denominator of the eyewitness statements describes him around 40 years of age, 5'8 to 5'11 in height, and had a heavy build and brown hair. The occupation of the Zodiac Killer has never been conclusively determined, but he could have a military background. Keeping this description in mind, let's have a look at a few suspects. Among hundreds of suspects interviewed by the police, Arthur Lee Allen was perhaps the most suspicious of all. Arthur Lee Allen was brought to the attention of the authorities for the first time by his friend Don Cheney after the school bus letter. Don Cheney claimed he had a few interesting conversations with Arthur Lee Allen on New Year's Day 1969, 11 days after the Lake Herman Road incident. According to Don Cheney, Allen told him that he would randomly kill couples by using the name Zodiac. He also told Cheney that he would use a flashlight attached to his gun to kill people at night. Allen had a military background and was enlisted in the U.S. Navy in 1957. He wore size 10 and a half shoes, the exact same size as the footprint observed in both the Lake Berryessa and Santa Barbara attacks. Moreover, the footprints were believed to be of a military-style boot, known as wingwalkers. 
Arthur Lee Allen also owned a Zodiac watch. With the infamous crosshair symbol seen on several letters, Brian Hartnell's car, and on the killer's black executioner's hood in the Lake Berryessa incident. He also possessed a typewriter, similar to the one used in typing the confession letter claiming the responsibility of the murder of Sherry Jo Bates. Michael Majo, the survivor of the Blue Rock Springs parking lot attack, identified Arthur Lee Allen as the killer from the photographic lineup, but it wasn't until 1991, more than 20 years later. He lived just a 10-minute walk from the payphone that Zodiac used to make a phone call to the police dispatcher after the Blue Rock Springs parking lot attack. Allen was arrested on September 27, 1974 for other criminal charges and was released nearly three years later on August 31, 1977. During this time, the Zodiac letters suddenly ceased and then resumed on April 24, 1978, in which Zodiac started the letter by saying, This is the Zodiac speaking. I am back with you. Despite these coincidences, no substantial evidence against Arthur Lee Allen has ever been found. The DNA and fingerprints recovered from several items, including the taxicab of Paul Lee Stein, did not match Arthur Lee Allen. Also, no matches were found between Allen's handwriting and the Zodiac letters. Allen remained a suspect until he died in 1992. Richard Reed Marshall was born in Texas in 1926, making him around 43 years of age in 1969. It was noted with suspicion that Richard Marshall resided in close quarters to where the murders took place. At the time of the murder of Sherry Jo Bates, he lived in Riverside. Also at the time of the murder of Paul Stein, he lived just a few miles from the crime scene and from the presumed pickup point. He also owned a typewriter similar to the one used in writing the confession letter after the murder of Sherry Jo Bates. On the other hand, Rick Marshall's fingerprints did not match the prints obtained from Paul Stein's cab. He was later cleared by Napa Police Department due to insufficient evidence connecting him to the murders. Richard Gajkowski, born in South Dakota, was a newspaper journalist by profession. He was also a trained army medic. He used to run a counterculture newspaper, which ran its operation close to the presumed pickup point and the crime scene of Paul Lee Stein. Reportedly, the newspaper staff used to be at its peak workload on Wednesday, the only day the Zodiac Killer never mailed any letter to the newspapers during the attacks. Richard Gajkowski was also a trained army medic, which not only could explain the military-style wingwalker shoe prints at Lake Berryessa and Santa Barbara, but also the way Paul Stein's shirt was cut in a clean rectangular shape a standard procedure taught in the field. According to the police dispatcher who received the phone call from the Zodiac Killer after the Blue Rock Springs parking lot attack, Richard Gajkowski's voice was the closest to what she heard on the phone. However, this was many years after the payphone call and could be argued as questionable. Richard Gajkowski died in 2004. Lawrence Kane, born in April 1924, was identified by Kathleen Johns as her abductor from a picture lineup. Kathleen had claimed that her abductor was the Zodiac Killer after identifying him from the police sketch. Lawrence shortly served in U.S. Naval Reserves in 1943. He lived less than a quarter of a mile from the presumed pickup point of the Zodiac Killer, the Union Square. On the other hand, Kathleen Johns described her abductor around 30 years of age, whereas Lawrence Kane was 45 years of age at the time of the abduction. Like others, no solid evidence against Lawrence Kane has ever been found. It is not difficult to ascertain how little there is against these suspects, but as many dots as the authorities could connect, Arthur Lee Allen has been the leading suspect among the police investigators because of his troubling history. According to Detective George Boward, who was investigating Arthur Lee Allen, quote, The only reason I look in that direction and I am 95% sure it was him is because so many coincidences point in his direction. What really bothers me about this case is that we were ready to charge Arthur Lee Allen with the idea in mind that it would be taken to trial so that 12 jurors could make that determination. But he died before we could do that. Apart from the incidents claiming seven canonical victims, there have been at least nine other unsolved incidents associated with the Zodiac Killer from 1963 to 1970, where the identity of the perpetrator remains a complete mystery. Whether the Zodiac Killer is responsible for these incidents or not remains a serious question, with so many other questions regarding his motive, accomplice if any, his puzzling schedule, cryptic communications, and his sudden end to inflict harm on more people. But without ascertaining his identity, all those questions remain unanswered, 
and hence the mystery of the Zodiac Killer remains unsolved.